Well, good morning, First Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. I pray wherever you are, you're comfortable. Uh, you are prepared to together uh, worship, serve, and rejoice in our Lord and our Savior. Our call to worship this morning is found in Isaiah 26, verse 4, and it reads, Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. Trust in the Lord forever. He's our rock, and he is eternal. Father God, I pray this morning as we gather to worship you and lift your name high, you would bless us and, and hold us and keep us. God, I ask for your mighty hand to be in and through our lives together as we worship and serve you. Bless this time together. Let it be honoring to you. Let it be uplifting to you. Father God, we worship you and we serve you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. safely go anywhere he leads me in this world I know anywhere without him dearest joys would fade anywhere with Jesus I am not afraid anywhere anywhere fear I cannot know anywhere with Jesus I can say I am not alone Other friends may fail me But he's still my own Though his hand may lead me Over dreary way Anywhere with Jesus Is a house of praise Anywhere Anywhere Fear I cannot know Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go Anywhere with Jesus I can go to sleep When the darkening shadows round about me creep Knowing I shall waken never more to roam Anywhere with Jesus will be home sweet home I can safely go anywhere with Jesus I can safely go then I cry oh rock of ages Sometimes I feel discouraged and I think my work's in vain. I'm tempted oft to murder. For me, then 
Thank you, Kylie. Partway through our service, we like to uh, just break for a moment um, and quiet our heart as we join together uh, in prayer. And so I would encourage you right now, wherever you are, whatever posture you have, whether you're sitting or you're standing or even lying down, to to quiet your hearts for a minute, uh, to reflect on the goodness of our God this week. Even though you may have had a difficult week and um, had to manage or deal with different uh, challenges, I, I pray that you will uh, pause and, and reflect on how good our God is, how loving and how just and righteous He is. And just for a few minutes, um, just spending quiet as you kind of lift up your hearts, perhaps your voice, in praise and thanksgiving uh, to him. Our sovereign Lord, we thank you so much for you. Thank you for being there, for being our God, for being our rock. Thank you for your creation. Thank you for all that you do, all that you provide. Lord God, we come to you this morning. We come with humble hearts, acknowledging your goodness, acknowledging you as our Lord, our sovereign God, our creator. And we thank you for moving in and through us. We thank you for providing, for blessing. We thank you for holding us this week and, and guiding us and keeping us. And we say we praise you, God, for being there. In the midst of those perhaps tense moment and making those difficult decisions that we perhaps had to make this week. And, and we thank you for being there. Lord, our God, I pray that continually we will abide in you, trust in you, commit 
our lives to you totally. I pray, God, that we will learn more and more to surrender ourselves to you, to give you our all. Lord God, I pray for a world. I, you see what's happening. You know what's happening all throughout. Nothing is a surprise to you. But we come to you, God, nonetheless, praying and asking, seeking for your mighty hand, for your protection, for your deliverance. God, we pray that you continue to heal our land. God, I pray for reconciliation. I pray for unity. I pray, God, we will put aside our differences or, or personal preferences and, and seek you each and every day. God, move in a mighty way. Restore us to you. God, fill us with the awesome presence of your tremendous love and who you are. God, I continue to pray for our land. You bless the doctors, the care workers, the nurses, the PSWs, Father, those who are on the front line working, administering aid and support and medication and love to those who are dealing with so much. Thank you for your hand, Lord God. God, we don't have all the answers and we don't know what tomorrow will bring, but we come to you, Lord, as our God, our sovereign king, and we say, God, move, lead. I pray, God, you continue to restore and bless and hold the doctors and nurses, Lord. Hold them up at this time. Give them courage. Give them strength to, uh, to continue. God, for those who are dealing with financial issues, relational issues, isolation, loneliness, God, I pray you would be with them. You are indeed the God of comfort. And we ask that your, your hand will continue to be on us and your Holy Spirit will be close to us. God, bless Canada, bless the U.S., bless our world. Help us, God, to see you in the midst of this very dark and challenging times. God, I pray that we will turn to you. We will engage in, with you. We'll seek you. Lord God, you are indeed the God who cares, the God who loves, the God who sees, and we let's cling to you. Bless those in our church, Father, this morning who's just needing your special hand of, 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 uh, of touch and blessing. I think of Chuck and ask for your continual love on him and Marilyn, Lord. Uh, be with him. Be close to him, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing, and I ask for more of your, your presence in his life, Lord. Be with Marilyn as well. Give her strength and courage through this time. Father God, I thank you for Richard and for this past week and the, and the good news that he can share about upcoming surgery that will help to alleviate the pain in his back. Lord, what a blessing. Thank you for his witness and his testimony of your great love for him, even in the midst of his own pain. Lord, thank you for him. Lord, for Marilyn Edwards, be with her and and guide her and keep her. For Rod and Judith, bless them and keep them. Lord, be with her families right now. I know many are, are missing being together and, and not having the fellowship that we're used to. God, comfort their hearts. Bless them. Hold them. Thank you that as a church we can reach out to each other and continue to connect and, and support and encourage Thank you for each person, and thank you for their love for you and their commitment to this body of believers, Lord. God, all that we have is because of you, and we want to continue as a church to lift you and, and praise you and acknowledge your goodness, your provision, 
your grace, your mercy. Thank you for this place that we can be here, and your blessing. God, spur us on to further work in our community. Open our hearts and our minds to the need of our community, Father. Give us your eyes, Lord. Give us your heart that we may reach out and bless those around us. Be with Craig as well, Lord. Just watch over him and keep him and, and love him. Be close to him. Father God, you are awesome, and we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your love. We thank you for who you are. Bless us now as we continue to worship and praise and lift your name. In your name we pray. Amen. faith will stand and I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours you are mine. Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Feet may fail and fear surrounds me. You've never failed, and you won't start now. And I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith would be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith would be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith would 
would be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. And I will call upon your name. Keep my eyes above the waves my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are mine You were always fighting for us, heaven's angels all around. My delight is found in knowing you wear the victor's crown. You're my help and my defender. You're my savior and my friend. By your grace, I live and breathe to worship you. At the mention of your greatness, in your name I will bow down. In your presence, fear is silent, for you wear the victor's crown. Let your glory fill this temple, let your power overflow. By your grace I live and breathe to worship you. Hallelujah, you have overcome, you have overcome, hallelujah, Jesus, you have overcome the world. You are ever interceding as the lost become the found. You can never be defeated, for you wear the victor's crown. You are Jesus the Messiah. You're the hope of all the world. By your grace, I live and breathe to worship you. Hallelujah. Every high thing must come down. Every stronghold shall be broken. You wear the victor's crown. You overcome, you overcome. Every high thing must come down. Every stronghold shall be broken. You wear the victor's crown. You overcome, you overcome. Every high thing must come down. Every stronghold shall be broken. You wear the victor's crown. You overcome. You
At the cross, the work was finished. You were buried in the ground. But the grave could not contain you, for you wear the victor's crown. Hello, my friends. Today the reading is from Acts chapter 8 the historical record of the apostles after the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. So we're looking at Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 3. I'm just going to start a couple of verses earlier for the context. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my soul. Receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the truth against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Thank you. Good morning, First Baptist. Thank you for joining us this morning. Wherever you are, may God's grace and peace be with you all. If you're just joining us, we're looking at the seven churches in Revelation, chapters 2 and 3 to see what we can learn about ourselves and what God is saying to us today. Last week, we looked at the church in Ephesus. We learned that they had great qualities. They were hardworking. They persevered. They endured hardship. They denounced false teachers and hated evil and maintained faithful service to God. They were a church that was committed to serving and living for God. Yet, God has had this to say about them. They had forsaken their first love. They had lost their passion and devotion for him. Despite their many great qualities and their passion for the work and for serving and denouncing evil and enduring hardship, they had lost or had forsaken their first love for him. They were doing good, good things in their own strength. And the truth is, on our own, we can accomplish nothing. They had neglected to make God supreme in their life. If Jesus is not first and foremost, then all our efforts are in vain, which can lead, and I've seen it, to fatigue, discouragement, burnout, and a loss of faith. The church in Ephesus had great qualities, but they had lost their zeal and their passion for Jesus. And we have to be careful about that as well. 
You can come to church and you can be involved in, in many great works within the church. But if Christ is not foremost, if he's not first, if our hearts and our commitment and our devotion is not to him, then the things we're doing is in vain. So we move to the second church, Smyrna. And I say this without judgment. Sometimes we, as Christians, misrepresent the Christian faith. And here's what I mean by that. In order to make Jesus acceptable to non-Christians or non-believers, we often paint a picture of ease. We infer that life will be so much better as a Christian. It is, but it isn't. But we over, at times, maybe not consciously, but we overemphasize the ease that we associate with being a Christian. Becoming a Christian is a good thing. It's a life changing decision. And we want people to like us and and accept us and accept Jesus. So we paint oftentimes this rosy picture. The prosperity gospel teachers grossly, and I would say deliberately, misrepresent the gospel message. According to their message, God wants everyone, everyone to be healthy, happy, and rich. Now I ask you, is that in the Bible? The opposite is true. The Bible says we need to take up our cross and daily follow Jesus. We have to surrender self to him. John 16, 33 says, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. It's clear In this world, we will have trouble, we'll have trials, we'll have persecution, we'll have hardship. But Jesus said, take heart, I have overcome the world. Christ's victory is our victory. His love for us carries us through life, through the hardship through the troubles. It's the blessed hope we have in him. He is everlasting, the beginning and the end. The Christian journey is not a cakewalk, and I know many of you can attest to that. I know many of you are going through some really difficult things in life right now and and the truth is it's not getting any easier I mean look around you look around the world today it won't get any easier but Jesus said be of good cheer take heart I have overcome the world so let's turn to the church in Smyrna and see what we can learn from them. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. It's the last book of the Bible. Revelation 2, 8 to 11. At the time Revelation was written, the city of Smyrna was the center of commerce and It had tremendous wealth. It was a bustling city. 
it was a city of great architecture. It, was, it had many different idols and statues. It was a bustling, busy, thriving city. Smyrna actually means myrrh, a fragrant, a fragrant spice. Yes, the same myrrh the Magi gave as a gift to baby Jesus at his birth. Smyrna is located 56 kilometers north of Ephesus. Today, it's called Izmir, the third largest city in Turkey. So it still exists today. It's a different name, but that city still is there. The city of Smyrna was also known for idol worshiping. And with that, the Christians in Smyrna experienced tremendous persecution. Ray Steadman writes, as early as AD 26, during the reign of Tiberius Caesar, a temple was erected to the emperor and all the citizens of Smyrna, including Christians, were expected to worship the Roman emperor. If you were a Christian in Smyrna, you were called upon once a year to appear at the temple and either say, Caesar is Lord or Jesus is Lord. Those who refused to confess Caesar as their Lord were either imprisoned or put to the sword. So Smyrna was a place of enormous oppression and persecution for the early church, end of quote. So let's turn to the church in Smyrna and see what we can learn again. Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, and if you remember last week I said that the word angel here doesn't refer to angels as we know them, but it's, re it's a reference to the minister, the pastor, uh, the messenger of that church. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of him who was the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. May God bless the reading of his word. So let's work through our five questions that, we've, uh, that we're going to work through. So question one, what does Christ say about himself to the church in Smyrna? What does Christ say about himself to that church? Well, look at verse 8. It reads, he is the first and the last who died and came to life again. He is the first and the last who died and came to life again. I love it. This is so great. God is describing himself. He's making himself known. He's saying, I'm the first and the last who died and came to life again. Jesus lived a perfect life, then offered himself as a sacrifice to atone for our sin, 
this act resulting in the reconciliation of a fallen world to God. God is reminding us of who he is. He is eternal. He is sovereign. He is everlasting. He always is and will be. Hebrews 13, 8 reads, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and tomorrow. He's everlasting. He's the same yesterday and today, and he will be tomorrow. My friends, you can rely on him. You can trust in him. He is consistent. He's dependable. He's trustworthy. He's telling the church in Smyrna, I am everlasting. I am mighty to save. I gave my life for you. He's the first and the last. And he died and came back to life again. And he did that for us. Question two. What does Christ say is good about this church? Look at verse 9. He says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. Interesting choice of words. I know your afflictions and I know your poverty, yet you are rich. He's not talking about physical wealth or possession or the accumulation of stuff. This is a church oppressed, crushed, and afflicted. Yet, they are rich in spirit. They are rich in their faithfulness and their devotion. What a contrast to the church in Ephesus. God is saying to this church, despite you being oppressed, being crushed, being afflict afflicted, you are rich in spirit. You're rich in faithfulness. You're rich in devotion. This church is gracefully Enduring suffering. I don't know about you, but I don't run to trouble. In fact, I run away from trouble. And I know I'm not alone. We tend to avoid pain, suffering, and hardship. Jesus is saying to this church, I commend you for persevering. I commend you for hanging tough. That's a good thing. You are indeed rich because of your commitment, because of your faithfulness. In times of hardship and trials, if you seek him, God will give you the ability to manage, the strength to cope. And this church understood that. They faced just tremendous persecution, yet their heart for God was solid. They were poor in suffering, but rich in the presence of God. That comes from cultivating an ongoing relationship with God. Despite persecution, they hadn't 
forsaken their first love. My friends, hard times will happen. Persecution will come. If we are committed to God, if we trust in Him, if we're totally sold out to Him, He will bless us. He will hold us. And He will keep us. Question three. What is bad about the church in Smyrna? Here it is. Nothing. Zilch. Nada. Jesus had nothing to rebuke them about or to criticize them about. This church got it together. This church was on fire for the Lord in the midst of tremendous suffering. He had nothing negative or rebuking to say about them. Wow. I believe in their suffering, they had a testimony of praise. If I'm honest, that puts me to shame. I tend to whine when things aren't going my way and trying to find excuses for and sometimes blame. I have a lot to learn. Question four. What does God expect from them? And it's not what you think. Look at verse 10. Jesus said, you will suffer some more and go to prison. What? More suffering and imprisonment? That's what you expect from us? Where's the feel-good vibe here? The promise to take your pain and hardship and replace it with wealth, happiness, and riches. Not here. This is the take up your cross and follow me message. This is the trust me. I'm the everlasting message. What would the reaction be, do you think, if someone said to you, so tell me what it's like being a Christian. So what's it like being a Christian? This person doesn't know, and so they're, they're looking for information about how to be or what a life like as a Christian. And what if you said to them, oh, you'll suffer to perhaps the point of death. You may go to prison. You will endure hardship. You will suffer tremendous persecution for your faith. People will tell lies about you. But hey, don't despair. One day, you will wear the victor's crown. I can tell you, not too many people will say, I want some of that. Sign me up. I need some more persecution, to be in prison, to go through hardship. Not too many people will quickly say, that's what I want. But if that's your sales pitch, trust me, you'll have very little to no takers. This is not your warm and fuzzy message. There's no health, wealth, and prosperity in that message. But that's exactly the life of a believer. It was then, 
now and will be in the future. As a believer, we should not expect or demand a life of ease and comfort and well-to-do. That's not what we're called to do. What God expects from them, the church, and us, it's back in verse 10, and it's this. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'll give you life as your victor's crown. Don't be afraid. I will give you life as your victor's crown. God is saying to the church in Smyrna and to us, I got this. I got you. I'm everlasting. I gave you. I gave my life for you. As believers, we shouldn't be afraid to share the gospel. There's the good news this world needs, the truth of the gospel. Question five, what is God's promise to that church? And it, uh, it's explained in verse 11. And in summary, you will live in eternity with him. You will receive a crown of life. This is not a crown that a monarch or a king wear with diamonds and stuff on it. It's more like um, a laurel wreath when, uh, where ancient Greeks athletes receive after winning an event or winning a, a race. They would wear this um, uh, leaf-like thing on their, on their head. That's what he's referring to. So the symbolism makes sense. Like an athlete, you train, you train hard, you persevere, you push through difficulties, and when you win, you wear the victor's crown. The believer's ultimate reward, the believer's ultimate reward is eternal life. The acknowledgement of God's blessing. James 1.12 gives us the answer. You ask the question, and the Bible gives you the answer. James 1.12 reads, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. The crown of life, the victor's crown, eternal life with God. Yes, it's hard right now. Yes, there's hardship. Yes, there's persecution. Yes, there's troubles. Yes, there's trials. But at the end, you persevere, you cling to God. The reward is a victor's crown. In heaven, with our God. So what is God saying to us today? It's simple this. This is question six. Our application question. What is God saying to us today? It's simply this. If we trust Him in times of persecution, hardship, and trials, He'll give us the gift of eternal life. If we trust Him, if we cling to Him, if we're devoted to him in times of persecution and hardship and trials, he will give us the gift of eternal life. 
That trust requires us to let go of self and surrender to him, to take up our cross daily and follow him. Christians in places like Africa, India, China, the Middle East are being persecuted and martyred for their faith. More Christians were killed in the 20th century than in any other century. I mean, that's happening today by the hundreds. The world hates God. And if they hate God, they will hate you too. We need to be praying for those churches in very those difficult places and pray for the Christians there too as well. So what can we learn from the church in Smyrna? So I'm thinking we should change our name. We should drop First Baptist Church Ingersoll and call ourselves the church from Smyrna. Has a nice ring to it, don't you think? The church from Smyrna. I'm just kidding for those who think, Pastor Trevor, what are you saying? I'm just kidding. But given the choice between hardship and ease, most people would choose ease. But it's not about what we would choose. It's not like a game show, let's make a deal. It's about what God is calling us to be and what he's preparing us for. We are to stand firm, to be faithful, to serve him, to live for him, even in difficulties for us to endure. My friends, the time is coming when the church, right now the church is under attack in many different ways, but there are more to come. But we're encouraged to take up our cross daily, and it's not easy. It's difficult. And God knows that. But that's what we're expected to do. If you expect a life of ease and no worries and no hardship, you're going to be disappointed because a true follower of Jesus Christ will face persecution. If you became a Christian under the impression that all your problems will be gone and, and all your needs will be met, just like that, you were misled. And I apologize for that. Our message to unbelievers is not about a life of ease and prosperity. It's but hardship and trials. But we're not alone. We have a God who holds us and cares for us and walks with us, like the church in Smyrna. But the good news is that we have an eternal hope. We have a God who is everlasting who walks with us, who talks with us. He calls us his own. A God who is everlasting, who in times of hardship and difficulties is there for you. Again, James 1.12 reads, Blessed is the one 
who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Our God cares. He loves us. He holds us. Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for holding us and being there. Lord God, we, we praise you. And with God, we know that there's more hardship and persecution for the church on the horizon. And Lord, we want to invite you and, and claim your promises. Like the church in Smyrna, Lord, in the midst of affliction and oppression and persecution, look to you with praise. Look to you as our God who restores and blesses and holds. God, we give it all to you and ask for your hand and your protection on us and our churches. In your name we pray. Amen. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a a melody I raise a hallelujah heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I raise a hallelujah. Fear you lost your hold on
gonna sing a little louder I'm gonna sing a little louder I'm gonna sing a little louder I'm gonna sing a little louder Hallelujah, indeed. Father God, we thank you so much that we can praise you. And it's not about what we have and what we get, but we praise you because you are God and you're worthy of all praise and honor and glory. Father God, help us to change our mindset, to, to think less about a life of ease and a life of how can we boldly live for you in the midst of backlash and lies and, and persecution, Father. There's so many out there that doesn't know you, and, and God, we have the opportunity to share this wonderful gift, the gift of your Son. Lord, make us bold. As a church, Lord, help us to be bold for you. Help us to live with sincerity, authenticity and love for those around us. God, we know persecution will come. It is inevitable as we walk with you, as we stand for your righteousness, we will face persecution. But God, we know that you are with us and you go before us and we can rely on you. Father God, we praise you. Today, we, we praise your name, and God, we, we say, come, Lord, come, and work in our hearts, work in our churches, and lead us to the place of total surrender to you, and stepping out in faith, believing that your will will be done. All these things, Father, we, we acknowledge to you, and we bring to you, and we say, praise you, amen. I pray you have a good week. I pray you continue to rely and trust in our God who is there for you. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're dealing with, He's there. He's our God who cares and who loves. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go with Him. Go in peace. And indeed, raise a hallelujah to our God and to our King. Amen. Amen.